Yeah, hi everybody, welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Roman Babst and I'm working as an employee at the Computer Vision and Graphics Faculty at ETH in Zurich. And during my work I'm actively contributing to the PX4 autopilot uh, platform, which I will introduce in a bit. Um, I want to apologize, Lawrence Meyer couldn't make it to this presentation here, but I'll do my best to make this a smooth experience for you. So today I'm going to be talking about ROS on drone code systems. Actually, that's not quite right. I'm just going to be talking about one specific drone code system. So to give you an overview of what I'm, be, what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to start by introducing you to the PX4 Autopilot project for those of you who are not yet familiar with it. Then I'm going to show you how you can use PX4 together with ROS and why that makes sense. Uh, after that, I'm showing you a specific case study in which I'm going to present you a company that is actively using PX4 together with ROS for their software in the loop simulation. And finally, I'm going to tell you what's going to come next or what we are excited to do in the next few months. Uh, so to make sure you guys do not sleep during the talk, I'm going to start by showing a small video uh, showing you the main capabilities of the project. Yeah, so that kind of uh, summarized our activities in the last uh, few years. So the PX4 Autopilot project is an open source, open hardware autopilot project, mainly written in C++. It was founded and maintained um, back in 2009 by Lawrence Meyer as a master student's project. Uh, its main goal at the beginning was to provide a uh, research uh, platform for researchers. And uh, until, until now, it has evolved to be one of the most uh, deployed open source autopilot projects, both in research and non-research projects. Uh, as the title of this presentation already suggests, it's also one of the projects uh, um, supported by the Linux Foundation drone code effort. Um, as you have seen from the video, it uh, supports three main types of vehicles, namely multi-rotors, fixed wing, planes, and vertical takeoff, air, uh, vertical takeoff and landing airframes. So um, on the uh, right side at the bottom, you can see probably the hardware on which the autopilot is mostly deployed. That's uh, the Pixhawk, the so-called Pixhawk, uh, manufactured by 3DR. And this together with the GPS um, uh, embodies uh, all the necessary sensor infrastructure, hardware infrastructure, to make a drone airborne and uh, fully autonomous. So in order to connect the link to ROS, I'm going to go a bit more into detail about PX4 software ar architecture. When I started working on the project about one and a half years ago, the one thing that fascinated me the most or that I liked, that I liked the most was the fact that everything was built up in a, in a modular design. 
So in this figure, you can see that you have modules like flight control, state estimation. On the other hand, you have sensor drivers, actuator drivers, and they are all separated clearly from each other in different layers. Uh, and this is what I think is the main advantage of the, of the project, because these modules can communicate with each other over topics, similar to ROS. Uh, they can subscribe to topics to read data, or they can publish on topics to make data available for, for other topics. So if you are, for example, a controls engineer, and you don't care about the entire project, you just want to do controls, then it's very easy to write your own application. You just have to learn about the, the simple mechanism of how to handle data, and then you can very easily integrate your own modules into the PX4 flight stack. So it's very easy to write new applications, even for, for beginners. And this is actually where it's very similar to ROS. These DSP PX4 modules actually remind of ROS nodes, which also use this uh, publish-subscribe messaging pattern in order to communicate with each other. So it was natural for us to port certain core PX4 modules to run in a ROS environment as ROS nodes. We used the wrapper functions to avoid code duplication, so eventually we would, we would be able to compile our modules for either ROS or for native uh, PX4. Uh, the advantage of having PX4 modules run as ROS nodes is that we can benefit from all the available ROS packages. That's extremely helpful if you plan to do uh, um, vision-based navigation or control. But we do, not, we do not have a new ROS code base. We still have it, uh, everything in one single uh, code base. Uh, on the left side, you can see an example of how you could deploy PX4 with ROS. On the left side, you have the deeply embedded controller, which could be the PixHawk, running the time-critical uh, flight control stuff. And on the right side, you have a Linux companion computer, which could be an Odroid or Raspberry Pi, for example. And there, you, you, you would be able to run uh, PX4 apps as ROS nodes and making use of things like SLAM or obstacle avoidance. And the good thing is that you, you, you always have a backup, so even if this system here crashes, this one would still be able to, to fly your drone home, maybe. Uh, so that was just one application. Another possible application that we made use of was uh, our software in the loop simulator with ROS. So having ported the core PX4 modules into a ROS environment made us or gave us the ability to, to simulate part of our system in a, in a ROS environment. Um, let me just briefly explain to you the, the, the most important components of the simulation. There's a a, um, there's a simulating code base called Rotor S, which was, um, which was uh, started by the Autonomous System Lab in Zurich. And this code base offers the most common multi-rotor uh, multi models and also simulated sensors, such as an IMU or, or an odometry sensor or VI sensor. And then we have um, Gazebo as our physics engine and graphics render, which probably most of you also know. This can be interfaced directly to ROS using the available wrappers, and the Gazebo plugins allow a very convenient method to interact with your model and to extend it. So I'm going to give you an example now of who could use this system. I'm going to introduce you to a company called Wingtra. Wingtra is a startup company with roots to ETH Zurich. Uh, they are, um, their goal is to combine the strength of both multi-rotors and fixed wings into a new design which you see here. So they developed a tail-sitter model which is able to hover, uh, do precise landings, but still fly very efficiently as a fixed wing and can be used for uh, many applications. They are actually using our software in the loop environment with ROS very successfully for prototyping their controllers. So generally they are always prototyping their algorithms, testing it in this um, SITL environment, and then they do their flight test. And they also plan to use ROS for uh, vision-based navigation and control in the future. So I'm going to show you two videos now. One of them showing the simulation of this tail sitter doing a front transition from hover to forward flight. And after that, I'm going to show you uh, the result, the, the outdoor results that they obtained. Uh, 
And the corresponding outdoor video would be this one here. Okay. Uh, to finalize my presentation, I would like to give some words on what's to come next, what you can expect. As you probably all know, uh, Qualcomm has announced the release of their Snapdragonfly uh, development platform. And obviously, it's, it, it will be very interesting to have PX4 modules run as ROS nodes on this platform because it offers all the infrastructure that you need to do uh, vision-based navigation and control or market tracking. And it's just great because you can just use the variety of all the available ROS packages that already exist on this uh, uh, fine piece of hardware. That's it. Thank you. Uh, maybe I should say at the beginning that this uh, simulator is uh, available open source on the GitHub, uh, first thing. And uh, yeah, probably historical reasons, I would say. I mean, the, the Autonomous System Lab started with this thing, and it would, they just made it so generic and nice to work with that there was no reason for us not to, not to adapt their, their system. Yes? Um, sorry? Uh, yeah, the question was um, about the interference between, uh, between ROS and PX4, if we still have like the Mavlink app running. Maybe um, I should say what we did is we just, we didn't port the entire PX4 system uh, to ROS. We just ported those systems that are interesting to us. For example, for doing the software in a loop simulation, we ported the controllers but we do not actually have a Mavlink app ported. For that, for example, we, you, uh, we use Mavros to communicate between, for example, uh, the um, companion computer and our Pixhawk. Uh, sorry, I, I, I do not get the question. Why did you go for the retro approach? Was it performance? Was it some other? Except for this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the wrapping approach just enables you to have modules run native PX4, but at the same time also be available for to run in a ROS environment. If you have that separate, then you're going to have code duplication. You're not going to be able to compare the system really nicely, and it's much better to have to have just one module, which is either compiled for ROS or for native PX4. So that's, that's the advantage we have in that. Okay. And it, it also gives you this opportunity of swapping the execution. Like, you can have it run on the, on the Pixhawk, on the, uh, on the other hardware, or you can have it run on, on a Linux computer. So you're free to choose that then. <laughs> 